Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Psalms. This is a whole series of 12 or 13 lessons on the book of Psalms, and of course there's many different things that could be discussed in the book of Psalms, as you would recognize. This is lesson number five in that series for February 3 of 2024, entitled, Singing the Lord's Song in a Strange Land. Hmm. Well, as usual, we'd like to begin with the word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we have come once again to look at these uh, references from Scripture to see what they might teach us about you and about your character and about how you have tried to struggle with dealing with your children, the rebellious ones especially, that have lived here for so many years and caused so much trouble. Help us to know how we might be able to help bring this whole sin problem to an end is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What immediately comes to your mind if someone says a strange land? Well, the Israelites in the Old Testament had two times when they were really in what could obviously be called a strange land. Obviously, the uh, captivity and the, and the slavery in Egypt would be the first time, and then this other time would be the Babylonian captivity, and then when they got over into, under Medo-Persia, they were allowed to go back home. So those are two things that we can think about anyway. We do not does, need... Does it have even a bigger meaning, like all of us here on this planet? Well, we're going to get into that. Just be patient a little bit. <laughs> Jim? From the Bible study guide, we do not need to get deep into the book of Psalms in order to discover that the Psalms are uttered in an imperfect world. One of sin, evil, suffering, and death. The stable creation run by the sovereign Lord and his righteous laws excuse me, is constantly threatened by evil. As sin corrupts the world more and more, the earth has increased more, excuse me, increasingly become a strange land. In God's people, this reality creates a problem for the psalmist. How does one live a life of faith in a strange land? Question. Okay, Gordon, there's your question. We're, we're living in a strange land now, according to these people. We see if you agree with that by the time we get to the end of the lesson. As we've already seen, the psalmist acknowledged God's sovereign rule and power. There's not, never any question about that in the Psalms, as well as his righteous judgments. And that's another question. They know that God is the everlasting and never failing refuge and help in times of trouble. For this reason, the psalmists are at times perplexed, who isn't, or we might ask, by the apparent, apparent absence of God and the flourishing of evil in the face of the good and sovereign Lord. You know, it seems like, okay, if God is in charge, he has all, he's all-powerful, why is all this evil going on? Freedom. Yeah, well, we, we know what some of the reasons are, but anyway, the paradoxical nature of the Psalms is prayers is demonstrated in the psalmist's response to God's seeming silence. In other words, the psalmist respond to God's perceived absence as well as to God's presence. So uh, sometimes they're obviously speaking to God and God seems to be responding, but other times it seems like they're speaking to God and it's if God's not there. Okay. Um, from our Bible study guide, Carrie. The presence of suffering and evil in our midst raises perplexing questions in the minds of many about God's character. Why did God allow sin to exist? Why does he allow the innocent to suffer? Why does he permit sin and suffering to continue? Why do the wicked prosper? prosper rather? Have God's promises in the Bible failed? Is scripture merely a beautiful literary masterpiece, inspiring but not divinely inspired for the spiritually inclined people? Or worse, are the Bible and its promises the delusions of pious minds? 
Are they without any basis in reality because ultimately God, as secular minds allege, doesn't exist? Wow. Sad to say, this line of inquiry is all too common among many minds today. The questioning of God's actions plants the seed of incredulity and skepticism, let me get this right, skepticism in the hearts of others, especially amongst the youth. All too often when such questions of unbelief arise in the minds of believers, the result is that, quote, the love of many will grow cold. That's Matthew 24, 12. And that's a section from our Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. And here's the very verse, Jennifer. Matthew 24, 12. Such will be the spread of evil that many people's love will grow cold. Now let's think about that for just a moment. The spread of evil causes people's love to grow cold. Why do you think that happens? Uh, Is sometimes they get ignored. Okay. Not absorbed into the church, well, whatever they're attending. Yeah, grow cold. What does grow cold mean? Ignore. They don't, they don't pay any attention to religious things or biblical things, Bible things, Christian things. Not important to them. It's like going yeah. into the darkness. They're overwhelmed with so much other data. That yeah. They... Okay, Gordon? From the Bible study guide, again, this from, again, from the teachers section. The Psalms are more than pretty songs in praise of God. They are meant to exert a profound impact on our understanding of such complex issues as the existence of sin and suffering. As we analyze the Psalter in light of this challenging subject, we again marvel at the raw honesty of the psalmists in their prayers. There's some very raw, shall we say, honesty that we're gonna discuss later. Yes. Their candor reminds us that we too can ask questions of the Lord. We also can express our doubts to Him. God will listen to our concerns happily if we inquire of him in faith and humility. He will reply to our humble questions and concerns, giving us light in the midst of our struggle with doubt and fear. From the Teacher's Bible Study Guide, 65. Okay, honesty, humility, faith. The Psalms span the full range of human emotions from the highest joy to the deepest depression. <clears throat> Could all those things be inspired? Psalm 74, Ira? verses 18 to 23. But remember, O Lord, that your enemies laugh at you and that they are godless and despise you. Don't abandon your helpless people to their cruel enemies. Don't forget your persecuted people. Rouse yourself, God, and defend your cause. Remember, the godless people laugh at you all day long. Wow. Don't forget the angry shouts of your enemies, the continuous noise made by your foes. Good news, Bible. Mm. Okay, now I'm going to repeat several times during this lesson one of the really important aspects we need to learn, and that's if, if a group of people in ancient times were doing badly, in the view of the rest of the people, it's because there's a problem with their God. If a nation conquers another nation, that means their God is more powerful than the nation, the God of the nation. They didn't think about, okay, well, what about the forces, the people themselves? No, it's the God who did, who's failed. And so here's what's happening. The people are looking around and they're, they're seeing the Israelites are having trouble. And so the gods are la they're laughing, not at the Israelites, they're laughing at their God. They're kind of laughing at the Israelites too. Yeah. So 70, Psalm 79, 9 to 12, help us, O God, and save us. Rescue us and forgive our sins for the sake of your own honor. What does that mean? For your name's sake is the way yeah. it's said some other places. Why should the nations ask us, where is your God? Now, of course, you can imagine why, how that could happen. At least theoretically, the, the correct worshipers of, of God don't have any idols, do they? Whereas these other people have all kinds of idols. So, okay, I see here's this, a God, and this idol, and this idol, and this idol. Where's your God? Huh? Yeah. 
Lord, pay the other nations back seven times for all the insults they have hurled at you. See, in the ideas of the psalmist, these insults are not just at the Israelites, they're at Israel's God. Is it all right to talk to God like that? It's called calling for vengeance. Yeah. Whoa. In these psalms, we see the psalmist trying to struggle with a question in the great controversy. They remind God in prayer that things are not looking very good for God. But at the same time, they know that God has infinite wisdom and power. So the question is, if God really has infinite wisdom and power, why is he allowing all these terrible things to happen? How do they know that he is? If it, how do they come to that conclusion? Well, from, because they believe in creation, because they believe that the children of Israel were rescued from Egypt. There, there didn't, doesn't seem to be any shortage of God's power in those situations. So I think that would probably be their main thinking. To the people in ancient times that I explained a moment ago, everything was a little hard to understand, was assumed to be handled by the gods. We have suggested repeatedly that when one nation conquered another nation, it was assumed that the god of the conquering nation was more powerful than the god of the losing nation. That same idea now applies to their thinking about evil and sin. When anything evil happens, God must be either responsible or he allows it. Or one of the evil gods did it, and some, some of them had that kind of an idea. The psalmist remind us, and God, all, and, and God, although he already knows this, that when evil succeeds, it provides an opportunity for God's enemies to blaspheme his name. So is it all right for a person to pray as if he's instructing God what God should do? Is that called well, presumption? I'm asking. The, their view of a God, though, is different than what the Israelites were supposed to be portraying. I'm just saying, this is, we, I, we're going to see the it. the reality of it. But. <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking about the psalmist actually wrote, yes. supposedly under inspiration. And I absolutely agree that it's inspired. Okay. Well, how does God deal with rebellious people who are causing troubles, who fail on their side of the contract? They had an agreement with God, right? From the days of Abraham. And they're failing on their side. And they claim, yet they claim, you know, we want all the benefits, God, but don't ask us to stick to our side of the bargain. We, we, we don't want to bother with that. Well, they kind of failed at all of those things from the very beginning. I wonder if they have any people today that are kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> Good thing there aren't people like that. Yeah. Christians, of course, recognize that ultimately God will be the winner. We, we know absolutely from the scriptures and writings of Ellen White, we know that in the end, God is going to win. And Satan and all his followers will be the losers. And we'll, we'll talk more about that as we move along. The psalmists, of course, there were a variety of them, all the way from Moses to uh, the children of Israel, some of them, whoever the psalm was, psalmist was in, in the Babylonian captivity, that, that huge span of time, all, all included in the psalms here. Uh, um, look back at the history of the Exodus, Jim, this is your question, as a great reminder of what, ca of what God can do. Think of the plagues of Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea, God speaking to them from fire, uh, from the fire cloud above the mountain, is leading them by the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day, and then helping them across the Jordan River after conquering the Amalekites and Sion and Og, etc., and other nations that had prevented their progress. And something that we don't often mention, which I think, but I think is very important, Judges specifically says that they crossed the Jordan River during flood season. And I have some pictures of flood season in the Jordan Valley back before they had all the dams in there and, the, and the, all the irrigation being siphoned off. Almost, almost the entire valley is flooding with water. So when they crossed, you know, the, the people in Jericho must have been thinking, oh, we don't have to worry about those people over on the other side of the river. It's, it's going to be months before the water goes down. No. They cross the river, it just says specifically, during flood stage. Well, 
Uh, finally, he helped them to conquer the numerous kings and cities, including the fortified city of Jericho. Remember that story. So Moses concluded. Carrie, I think that's yours. Okay, Deuteronomy 4, verses 38, 39. As you advance, he drove out nations greater and more powerful than you, so that he might bring you in and give you their land, the land which still belongs to you. So remember today and never forget, the Lord is God in heaven and on earth. There is no other God. And that's from the Good News Bible. Okay, now I want you to think about that comment there. Some import here. It says, the land, what? Which still belongs to you. Where did he get that idea? They, had, they hadn't even been in the land yet. They hadn't, not, a single per, not a single one of them had even seen it when he wrote these words. Except the, the, ten, the 12 spies, I guess Caleb and Joshua, were still alive. They had seen part of it. So where'd they get this idea? What did God promise Abraham? Anything you can see, standing up on the hill and look around, everything you can see belongs to you. And your descendants will be like the sand of the sea. That's right. As numerous as the sand of the sea. Yep. The psalmist did not hesitate to acknowledge the fact that the people of Israel were habitual sinners. Fortunately, there are none of those kind of people here today, right? And that was a problem for God and for his reputation. Many nations recognized that Yahweh was the God of the Israelite people. So what was God supposed to do when they are misbehaving? Okay, Jennifer? Psalms chapter 79, verses eight to nine. Oh, do not remember former iniquities against us. Let your tender mercies come speedily to meet us, for we have been brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Uh, hold, hold on, for the glory of whose name? Your name. God's name. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> and deliver us and provide atonement for our sins for your name's sake. The New okay. King James Version. So at least some of them recognize that God is getting the bad part of this, getting the bad reputation here, right? Yes. Some of the psalmists were wise enough and educated enough to recognize that more important than the success of Israel as a nation was a defense of God's character before the nations. These ideas, and by the way, how do we know that um, uh, there was, in, even in Moses' day, that the words about what God was doing for the children of Israel was getting around? How do we know that? Because Rahab said, we've heard about you. <laughs> yeah, we know about you people. Rahab, the prostitute yeah. in Jericho. Yep. These ideas are presented in Psalm 74, 18 to 23, which you don't have time to read, and Psalm 83, 16 to 18, but it's presented very clearly there. Also, Psalm 106, 47. Notice some of the highlights. Let's pick out just a few verse, a few note sentences there. Gordon? Psalm 74, 22. Rouse yourself, God, and defend your cause. I think we've heard that before. Yeah. Remember that godless people laugh at you all day long. And then Psalms 83, 18, may they know that you alone are the Lord, supreme ruler over all the earth. Good yeah. news Bible. Do you think the enemies that were attacking Israel, they acknowledge that fact? No. Nope. Could those same challenges that God had to deal with in the days of the children of Israel apply to us in our day? The Bible study guide says, as today, the same principle exists existed back then. Our sins, our backsliding, our evils can bring disrepute not only to ourselves, but worse, on the God whose name we profess. Our wrong actions can be detrimental, spiritual effects. And have detrimental. Yes, and have de detrimental spiritual effects on our witness and mission as well. How many people have been turned off to our faith by the actions of those professing the name of Christ. Wow. January 28th. And then um, Mrs. White says, honor, the honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. Wow. <laughs> Desire of ages. Yeah, page six. When, and when is that gonna happen? Oh, excuse me for putting that in the future. <laughs> 
it sure ha his people sure, certainly haven't had perfection of character yet, and we don't. I don't anyway. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you're speaking for yourself. Well, I'm speaking <laughs> for you, all of us here. Yes. Well, you, do you consider these issues as you live your life day by day? The issues about God's fairness and His care for His own people come starkly to the front when people are facing serious illness or death. The psalmist recognized that God had the ability to heal all kinds of diseases. So I mean, they, they, they recognize, you know, if God, if you wanted to, you could bring this person back to life if necessary. Okay? Psalm 41. One and then verses three and four. Happy are those who are concerned for the poor. The Lord will help them when they are in trouble. So, so now we can see that the argument is turning. Okay, we know that God has this power, all this power. We know all those kinds of things. Okay, so if God's getting a reputation, what should we do about it? Well, a good place to start is dealing with the poor and the, and the needy, right? Happy are those who are concerned for the poor. The Lord will help them when they are in trouble. That psalm right there, that has to do with health and healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. R rather than save me. No, mm -hmm. it's, it's heal me. And, and healing is a process. It takes time. The Lord will help them when they are sick and will restore them to health. I said, I have sinned against you, Lord. Be merciful to me and heal me. Good news, Bible. The psalmist issued a challenging question to God, essentially asking, if I die, can I praise your name? Can I worship you? Can I honor you in any way if I'm in the grave? Those would be fair questions, wouldn't they? Jim? Psalms 88, verse 12. Are your miracles seen in the place of darkness or your goodness in the land of the forgotten? From the goodness Bible. And there's other references there, but the idea basically is God, if you let us die, we can't be upholding your name. We can't be praising you. We can't be praying to you for dead. <laughs> the psalmist all obviously recognize that God's faithful people are not exempt from illness, even death. Does God allow trouble to come on his people only because they are not, because, only because they are sinning? Or do sometimes even innocent people suffer illness and death? And of course, we know the answer to that, don't we? What about Jesus, Jesus' life and death? It explains that, yeah. it answers those questions. Psalm 80, but they hadn't, they hadn't, that hadn't happened yet in the days of the psalmist, of course. No, but... Uh, yeah, no, it's, you're right. Psalm 88 and Psalm 102 are clear examples suggesting that the innocent do suffer despite being faithful followers of God. But there is a promise, and let's look at that for a moment. Psalm 41, 3 and 4. The Lord will help them when they are sick and will restore them to health. I said, I have sinned against you, Lord. Be merciful to me and heal me. Just repeating that, that text, which we looked at in a moment ago. Is remember, in fact, for example, as we've, these are examples of a person doesn't have to sin to be suffer, suffer the mm -hmm. consequence of evil. And it's collateral damage is yeah, what, what Jesus was. was you, you, you're departing from the teachings of the Pharisees. Well, that's, yeah, that's true. I'll take that. <laughs> it is important to notice that even when the psalmist felt that he was on death's door, he recognized that God had the power to heal him. Nothing is beyond God's power. And there's another part of that to look at. And I guess it's easier for me to understand that as I get past 80 years old. Uh, God, has a, God has plans for every one of our lives to last forever. If something bad happens to us in this life, this is just not even a twinkling part of, the, of God's full plan for us. We just got to be in harmony with Him, and then, you know, the end will work out. But everybody has to have the opportunity sure. to experience evil so that they know what they are rejecting and ultimately become persuaded that, yes, God, Yahweh, the, the Creator, the one only true God, knows yeah the future and what's best for you. Of course. Do I have to learn from my own mistakes or can I learn from the mistakes of someone else? Hopefully the other, the latter. Yeah. But unfortunately. So, so, so we don't all have to make all the mistakes. Make all those mistakes. Right. Yeah. And there's another part to that. When we get down to the time of the seven last plagues, the final events in this earth's history, Satan will have one final 
campaign to destroy all of God's people. And of course, God said, no, you can't do that. I'm not going to allow it. He will, the world, I mean, Satan will destroy this world in order to try to eliminate God's people. Well, he's, so, got, he's got his minions working on that right now. It's been sure. <laughs> for generations and, and millennia. But, but, okay. Uh, um, what do the sufferings of Christ in those final few days, Jim, as you were talking about, of his life on this earth, teach us about God's tolerance for suffering and evil? Would it be easy to ask the question, where is God as you pray to him? Notice these brief comments. Like I said, there's lots and lots of verses in these lessons. Think, Gordon, is that yours or is Myra? Mine, I think. Yeah. Gary's. Gary? Gary's turn. Gary? Psalm 42, 1 and 2. As a deer longs for a stream of cool water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for you, the living God. When can I go and worship in your presence? And that's from the Good News Bible. Psalm 69, 3, I am worn out from calling for help, and my throat is aching. I have strained my eyes looking for your help. Help, rather, that's from the Good News Bible. So when we are suffering or even threatened by death, should the biggest concern be that we are in trouble or that God does not seem to be hearing our prayers for healing? Hmm. <laughs> Notice specifically these questions from the psalmist about God's presence or absence. From Psalm chapter 10, verse 12, O Lord, punish those wicked people. Remember those who are suffering. From the Good News Bible. And, Psalm and then a very famous comment. Go ahead. Psalm, and then Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I have cried desperately for help, but still it does not come. From the Good News Bible, compare that to Matthew 27, 46. Which is the history of what? Jesus, Jesus on the cross. Jesus on the cross. This is the place he's, the verse he's That's quoting. He's quoting. He was quoting himself. Yeah. Well, and the question is, did he even, were these words just so, I mean, that's the kind of thing, if you have, the, you have the kind of relationship with God that he had, you would cry that whether or not it was in the Bible already or not, right? Okay. Uh, Psalm 27, verse 9, Don't hide yourself from me. Don't be angry with me. Don't turn your servant away. You have been my help. Don't leave me. Don't abandon me. O God, my Savior. And then Psalm 39, verse 12, hear my prayer, hear my prayer, Lord, and listen to my cry. Come to my aid when I weep. Like all my ancestors, I am only your guest for a little while. I wonder when I read that, what do you suppose that means? I'm only your guest for a little while. Does that mean I only live for a few years here on this earth? Like what did he have in think. That's huh? what comes to mind for me. Mm -hmm. It is important to notice that even when the psalmist did not seem to be getting answers to his prayers, he continued to recognize God's existence and continued to pray. He knew that God had done marvelous things for his people in the past, and he continued mentioning that in his prayers. They knew that God will come forth one day. Have you ever had an experience when it seemed like God was not hearing you? What did you do? What should you do? Asaph became, Asaph was, of course, one of the famous psalmists, became so, and he worked for, for David, he was one of the psalmists who worked for David. Asaph became so concerned about what, hap, what appeared to be God's absence that he wrote Psalm 77. What do you think the author was going through? And, uh, I mean, like I say, there are whole chapters that are answers to specific questions in this lesson. We just don't have to read, to read all of them, but let's read the kind of summary here. Gordon? When you are in trouble and God does not seem to answer, does that make things worse? Can you still trust him? If you review the times when God has taken vigorous action in the past, does it still make your distress seem even worse? Is it possible that God has changed? So the question is, okay, you look back at other experiences of other people. I mean, look at the children of Israel looking back at their, you know, coming out of Egypt and all the things that God did for them. And now it just seems like God is doing nothing. Do you say, you know, is God on vacation? 
you know, you, th you think about the Elijah story up on Mount Carmel with, the, with the, <laughs> all the priests dancing and jumping around, carrying on. You know, is your God on vacation? Is Baal relieving himself? What, what's he doing up there? Oh, boy. While weeping and crying and suffering all night long, the psalmist renewed his resolve to trust in God. Psalm 77, verses 5 and 10. Think of other times when God used experiences of sleeplessness to bring about great good. Can you think of some examples? What about Pharaoh's dreams? What happened as a result of Pharaoh's dreams? The land was prepared for the famine jo that Joseph helped. And Joseph was engineered. Joseph got to that incredible position. And the night the king couldn't sleep but heard about Mordecai's efforts to save his life. What was the result of that? No. Oops, sorry. You remember that story? We just... Yeah. Esther. Remember what happened is that Mordecai had saved the king's life and so when Haman came to say, you know, I want to hang Mordecai, God, <laughs> the king says, uh, excuse me, I want you to honor this person. Who do you want me to honor? Uh, this guy by the name of Mordecai. <laughs> And when Nebuchadnezzar could not sleep and Daniel was taken in to interpret his dreams in Daniel 2, what was, what was the result? Well, what should these stories teach us about trouble sleeping when we have serious problems facing us? <laughs> Is that a time for God to work with us when things are quiet? And there's also sleeplessness when there's depression. <laughs> the psalmist also recognize that God could be active. But yet, we, not, we, we, we may not be aware of what he is doing. And certainly that, that happens a lot of times, doesn't it? How should we respond to such a situation? God, we know you can do something, but we don't see you doing anything. Have you had such experiences in the past? There's a lot of references. Psalms 37, 49, 94, 125. What should we do when it appears like the wicked are prospering and God's faithful people are not. Is the problem that God is not paying attention? Or do the wicked seem to be saying the following? This is, here's some quoting from, from them. Psalms 94, 7. They say, the Lord does not see us. The God of Israel does not notice. Is that true? These are quotes now from the wicked people, right? Yeah. It just seems that way. There are even times when the wicked oppress God's faithful people. Should that be impossible considering God's justice and power as he rules the universe? Fortunately, the psalmist came to some wonderful conclusions after all the things that they've been up and down, back and forth about. Psalm 73, 1 through 20, we, we don't have time to read them all, but look at the conclusion, verse 27. Those who abandon you will certainly perish. You will destroy those who are unfaithful to you. Do you agree with that conclusion? Well, the New Testament seems to give us a similar picture. 1 Peter 1, verses 17. Jim? You call him Father when you pray to God, who judges all the people by the same standard according to what each one has done. So then, spend the rest of your lives here on earth in reverence for him. Okay, he judges everybody by the same standard. However, it is important to notice that several of the psalmists suggest we need to go to God's sanctuary to look for answers for our prayers. And let's think about that for a moment, because the lesson makes quite a point of that, and I, I missed it. I don't think I really understand what all they were trying to make. What, what happened this, in the sanctuary out there in the desert? What, what, thing, what things happened in that sanctuary? You came to the, to the front gate, you, you, said you brought a lamb, you confessed your sins, you cut the lamb's throat, the priest takes the body of the lamb and, and the blood and he takes it inside and he does, some of it, he sprinkles on the, the things off this and then the lamb gets probably burned and so forth like this, but you're not allowed to go inside there. So, uh, what happens in the sanctuary? It's only the priests are in there. 
Is, 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 am I missing something? In the holy place only once a year, the high priest. Mm -hmm, yeah. Now, I'm, I'm not arguing about the fact that they, that God came down and he, his pres presence dwelt in that holy place. And, and of course, there's the, the thing about God's presence is here and the law, the broken law is underneath inside the cabinet. And then there's that mercy seat that's halfway in between where God's, you know, God's presence is here and the law is down here and we're somewhere in between. We want to, we we're trying to appeal to God, but we're breaking all the, breaking the law. Well, does it comfort you to know that in the end God will destroy the wicked and save the righteous? Well, in her final chapter in Steps to Christ, entitled Rejoicing in the Lord, Ellen White dealt with very well with several of the problems we have been discussing. God intends for us to believe in Him, to trust Him, and to serve as beacons of light to all around us. But when we allow grief and sorrow and pain to sink us into our debt, into doubts, I'm sorry, about God, we are making serious mistake. Carrie? Let us keep fresh in our memory all the tender mercies that God has shown us, the tears he has wiped away, the pains he has soothed, the anxieties removed, the fears dispelled, the wants supplied, the blessings bestowed, thus strengthening ourselves for all that is before us through the remainder of our pilgrimage. That's from Mrs. White and Steps to Christ, page 125, paragraph 1. Okay, that's at the very end of the book, Steps to Christ. In Psalm 57, the psalmist recognized that when he prayed, eventually God would respond and his enemies would be turned back. And that would be probably David's psalm. The children of Israel were in a strange land when they were in Egypt. They were in an even more strange land when in Babylonian captivity. And what about us? As we continue to dwell in this world full of sin and evil, are we not still in a strange land? Yeah. No, it's not heaven. It's not heaven? <laughs> really? <laughs> Ellen White gave us some good advice. Uh, summon all your powers to look up, not down at your difficulties. Then you will never faint by the way. You will soon see Jesus behind the cloud, reaching out his hand to help you. And all you have to do is to give him your hand in simple faith and let him lead you. As you become trustful, you will, through faith in Jesus, become hopeful. From Testimonies for the Church. Okay, volume five of the Testimonies, 578. When God seems to be hiding his face and holding his hands behind his back, do what? Do not stop praying. Gordon? Psalm 77. 10 through 12. We looked at this. We, we mentioned this before. Now let's read part of it. Then I said, what hurts me most is this, that God is no longer powerful. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> really? I will remember your great deeds, Lord. I recall the wonders you did in the past. I will think about all that you have done. I will meditate on all your mighty acts. Okay, you want to read the next one as well? Psalms 89, starting with 46 first. Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your anger burn like fire? Remember how short my life is. Remember that you created all of us mortal. Who In other can... words, what does that mean? <laughs> We're not going to live forever, right? Uh, that's what he says in the next line. Who can live and never die? How can human beings keep themselves from the grave? Lord, where are the former proofs of your love? Where are the promises you made to David? Don't forget how I, your servant, am insulted, how I endure all the curses of the heathen. Your enemies insult your chosen king, O Lord. They insult him where, wherever he goes. Praise the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Good news, Bible. Okay. So he's, he's, he's thinking for one moment about the faithful people, and then the next moment he's talking about these enemies, right? Mm -hmm. Psalm 89 is cited in its Hebrew title as a poem by Ethan the Ezraite. Okay, now you're all going to tell me who Ethan the Ezraite is, right? Mm -hmm. well, our SDA Bible Dictionary tells us that Ethan was a Judaite son of Zerah. 
He was probably the Ezra height, famous for his wisdom, mentioned in 1 Kings 4.31. Some identify him with the e Ethan the Ezra height and the superscription of Psalm 89, which is what we're talking about there. But it is not certain when this Ethan lived, so we're not sure exactly when this particular psalm was written. Okay? I think it's yes. Myra? From Mrs. White from Testimonies, Volume 3. Faith grows strong by becoming, by coming in conflict with doubts and opposing influences. Experience gained in these trials is more of more value than most costly jewels. Okay, so if we, if we survive through doubts and opposition, our we faith grows. Something more important. Something more important. The ultimate question that Christians sometimes ask is, why does God allow sin and suffering to exist? Notice the psalmist comments about that question. From our Bible study guide, when tension, what tensions did the psalmist experience in the face of evil? What similar tensions have you faced and how have you dealt with them? How do you maintain your faith during these times? Um, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop and ask the, uh, what I think is the obvious question here. Does God specifically plan troubles and discouragements and problems to the faithful so they can develop their faith? No. No. I don't think so. I think we bring them on ourselves. <laughs> we bring them on ourselves? We live in a, in a <laughs> world, a, a planet that is messed up. Well, Job is, is a good example. Mm -hmm. now, did God bring it on him? How many Jobs are there living around? Do you know? One, not not living now, <laughs> but Job of, of yeah, Old no. Testament times. And um, you know who brought it on him? It wasn't God. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Job himself. It wasn't his family. It was Satan that brought it on. Well, in a so sense, that's the freedom that that uh, the, the Elohim have. They can come in and manipulate. They can give false uh, testimonies. Look at, Je at Genesis chapter three. Uh, 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 well, that's the Satan himself, yeah. Well, it's still false testimony. Yeah. And uh, uh, the, the, that's the freedom. In Genesis chapter 1, two places he says, take dominion. In other words, I, I, God doesn't want to control you. Why don't you have the freedom and to experiment and, f and figure out how life works? Okay. So, where should we look for answers when our faith is uh, in By the God? Way, I say one thing I missed there. He wants you to listen. Yeah. And you don't need a Bible to listen because that's one thing you can't mess that thing up with the well, Bible. You listen to the Bible. Yeah. Well, the Bible is, you got, I could find numerous texts in one, one t uh, t translation, it'll say one thing. And even in the same translation in, in, in the, another Bible or book of the Bible, it'll say just the opposite. So, so you, you have to use your head. Yeah, and, and sometimes it needs to be good to work with other people that have, have better sure. opportunity to have insights. And, uh, but just to say, hey, God punishes and destroys, uh, uh, some of these texts are, are as, as bad as the book of Job. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and this isn't as bad this week as it was last week. Mm -hmm. Well, back to our question. Do we expect, do we say God, do we question God about the goodness and power, his goodness and power? Sure, why not question him? Maybe you'll find an answer. How do you answer the common question about evil in a world created and sustained by an all-powerful God of love? How does the great controversy motif help answer at least somewhat this challenge? And of course, we talk about that all the time in our group here. Well, I would retranslate Genesis chapter one, verses one and two. In beginning, he created Elohim, the heavens and the earth, and the earth became a chaos. Because now, because we have to have a place to put the war in heaven, Revelation uh, chapter 12, mm -hmm. war rose in heaven, uh, chapter 12, uh, 7. And then uh, Isaiah uh, 45, 18, he d created the earth to be inhabited. He did not create it a chaos. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you want to read... I think your turn, your turn, Psalm 74, verse 1 there. Me, I think. Is, this? is it yours? Okay. You had yours, didn't you? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, a poem by Asaph, 
Why have you abandoned us like this, O God? Will you be angry with your own people forever? And the Good News wow. Bible. The Psalms are more than pretty songs in praise of God. They are meant to exert a profound impact on our understanding of such complex issues as the existence of sin and suffering. As we analyze the Psalter in light of this challenging subject, we again marvel at the raw honesty of the psalmists in their prayers. Their candor reminds us that we too can ask questions of the Lord. We also can express our doubts to Him. God will listen to our concerns happily if we inquire of Him in faith and humility. He will reply, reply rather, to our humble questions and concerns, giving us light in the midst of our struggle with doubt and fear. From Adult okay. Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Okay, there's a couple of interesting chapters in the Psalms that we need to compare. Psalm 74 and 79 would be nice if we had a long time. We could lay them out here and everybody could look at them side by side, but we're going we're gonna to see a, a sort of a summary here. It raises a lot of important questions. Jennifer, you want to take that up? Sure, from the Bible Study Guide. Each psalm deals with the destruction of the beloved city. Now, it's talking about these two psalms, 74 and 79, let's, and, and, they're, and comparing them. So each one of them talks about the destruction of the beloved city, Jerusalem. And will that be at what time in history? We don't know. Mm. We don't know which particular thing he's talking about here. But and go ahead which elicits plaintive laments from the psalmist. In both Psalms, Asaph wants to see the Lord overturn the destruction. Thus, he inquires of the Lord, how long? Now, I will say that the Asaph, assume this is the standard one that we're talking about, he, he lived in the days of David. Okay, go ahead. The cause of Jerusalem's misfortunes is the sin of the people, from Psalm 79, 8 to 10. Only Psalm 79 mentions this reason. God's people have failed. In okay. both songs, Asaph doesn't lose faith in his heavenly king, from Psalm 74, 12 to 17, or his confidence in, quote, the greatness of your power, from Psalm 79, verse 11. As Asaph, we may ask why we face sin, suffering, and death. These are the universal questions that inquiring minds have asked from the dawn of human history. What do we call those questions? The existential questions. The existential questions. And what are those existential questions as briefly as possible? Oh. Why are we Why here? here? Well, first of all, where did I come from? Where are we going? Yeah, where did I come from? Why are we here? And is it possible to do any good or bad in life? And then where do we go after we die? So those are the existential questions. Okay. The answer is always the same, sin. Sin is the strange intruder in God's creation. From Satan's fall in heaven to our fallen condition today, iniquity has spawned all the suffering and death in history. We could argue justifiably that God has given free will to his creatures and from there philosophize about the ramifications of sin and suffering. But the biblical writers refrain from this tack. Let us then, as Asaph did, trust in our Creator's power and wisdom to resolve this question in His own way and time. Okay. I would leave, where it's, that it says, give free will, I would leave the word will out because that I think gives the wrong impression. We, a person has the freedom to make a choice, make a decision, mm -hmm. but to will implies that you have the wherewithal to carry it to fruition, and uh, that may not be the case. But for, you do have the freedom, the capacity to make a choice. Okay. Um, so the question here is, in, in our day, we tend to leave God out of this discussion. You know, we, okay, why is there evil in the world? Why is there this? Why is there wars? Why is those other things like this? And, and, and we tend to leave God out. Whereas in their day, God was the center of the discussion. If, all, if something happens bad, it's, it, it's, well, why is God involved? Why is he allowing this? What's going on? So, forth. so we need some kind of a compromise between our leaving God out and their, I mean, it's not to say that God is responsible for everything, but what is God's role in 
all the things that we see going on even in our world today. In dealing with the question, why does God allow the innocent to suffer, we should carefully read Psalm 66, 41, 88, and 102. Uh, there's a bunch of different Psalms that are all dealing with that same question. And again, it would be great if we had time to read all these, which we don't. But let's look at some, at least sort of summary things there. Psalms 102, verse 16 plus. When the Lord rebuilds Zion, he will reveal his greatness. He will, he will hear his forsaken people and listen to their prayer. Write down for the coming generation what the Lord has done so that people will not so people not yet born will praise him. The Lord looked down from his holy place on high. He looked down from heaven to earth. Okay, let me interrupt. Okay, yeah. Let me interrupt for just a second. Why does the psalmist say, write it down? It says Take for note. the coming generation. Yeah, for the coming sure. generations. In, in, in Bible times, the way you make something happen, I mean, the way you make it possible for people to know about it and, re, re, you know, they don't have, they didn't have computers, they didn't have all the methods, we have the news, etc. And we just have all that kind of stuff goes on almost automatically, doesn't it, with all our electronic stuff and so forth. So the purpose of recording this is that coming generations can learn something, right? Okay. Myra, I think oh, you're next. Okay. Bible study guide says, First, we must note that these four songs, Psalms 6, 41, 88, and 102, describe the suffering that the psalmist experienced because of illness. Second, the psalmist plead with the Lord for healing. They, are, they consider their healing to be a vindication of God in the presence of their enemies. Okay, they consider what's the vindication of God? Their healing. Okay. The question is, in this context, were there miracles of healing going on in those days? Do we just assume it's true because of what we read here? Why not? We, 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 we don't have any evidence of that, do we? Well, well what we do know is there, there, there are... There was some in Jesus' time, but... Yeah. Elijah, Elisha, tr tremendous yeah. healings. There were four times in the history of the Bible and there were lots of major miracles. If you want to include all possible miracles, you start out with creation. That obviously was a miracle. Then you talk about the exodus from Egypt. Then you talk Elijah and Elisha. There was obviously a bunch of miracles that happened that time. And then you talk about the time of Jesus and the disciples. And there, are, there were a few other times, but those, not, not many. Uh, why did why did there why were there lots of miracles in those times and not at other times? Times of low faith. Were there more miracles when there's low faith or more miracles when there's lots of faith? More miracles when there's no faith. Oh boy, you're getting us into all kinds of craziness. Does that mean that we are at a times of great faith since we're not having a whole lot of miracles seemingly? Hmm. Mm. I don't think okay, so. Okay, well, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I interrupted. Well, I think there's still miracles happening, but they're not the, the open healing mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. wounds or whatever. Okay, finally, they argue persuasively that, and they being... Hold on, you're reading number what? I, I, this is the... Um, number 40. 40, yeah, okay. Bible study guides okay. for... Songs. Yeah. So finally, they argue persuasively that had they died, they would have been bereft in the opportunity to praise God's name. That's... Okay. Oh. At this point in our analysis, we should note that the Hebrew mind was not interested in asking philosoph philosophical questions about human pain and suffering. Rather, its focus was on God and His glory. The psalmists acknowledge that the Lord permits their sorrows, Psalm 6, 1. They also acknowledge that he alone can give health. Cured from, of their afflictions, they want to testify of God's healing mercies. Notice especially that even when the psalmist was crying out that God seemed to have disappeared or was hiding his face, the psalmist still recognized God's presence and prayed to God to help him. 
Even if he can't see me, if he doesn't see me responding, even Jesus did that, didn't he? Shouldn't we have the same response? Our Bible study guide says, the answer that the writer himself provides is simple but crucial. Remember in the presence the miracles that God has wrought for you in the past. I will remember the works of the Lord. Thereafter, the psalmist describes the most paradigmatic moment of God's intervention in Israel's history, the exodus from Egypt. The psalmist recalls the wonders that Yahweh performed when he delivered his people from Egyptian bondage. Special attention is given um, to the miraculous parting of the Red Sea. I mean, you know those stories. Your way is in the sea. The psalmist also recalls how God guided the ministry of Moses and Aaron. And Ellen White comments, Jim? We have nothing to fear for the future except as we, have, as, as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and is teaching it our past history. Ellen White, wow. Jungle Conference Bulletin. Did Churchill steal that? Probably. In conclusion, we can look at Psalm 37 and see a number of issues spelled out in detail in the Teacher's Bible Study Guide. And again, we're, we're, we're just having to snatch little pieces here. Carrie, you want to notice there's going to be a couple of comments and then there's a promise. There's a couple of comments and a promise. So we need to go ahead. Okay. In conclusion, we can look at Psalm 37 and see a number of issues spelled out in detail in the Teacher's Bible Study Guide. Trust in the Lord, do good. There's a promise there. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord. And there's a promise. He shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. Promises, and he shall bring it to pass. And Psalm 37, 5. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath rather. Do not fret, it only causes harm. And the promise? For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. This psalm is a masterpiece of literary form and substance. Were we to ardently endeavor to practice the guidelines contained within, we would avoid much disappointment and bitterness. As an extra bonus, the text of the psalm provides us with encouraging promises that motivate us to put its precepts into action. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for these insights. Um, they are sometimes a little bit, they, they lead to questions that we still struggle with, but yet we recognize that these songs, which were prayers, um, can provide us a lot of insight in how we should live our lives. We thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.